All right, I think we can get started. Well, hello to our virtual audience and welcome to this afternoon's discussion with the Black Lady Art Group presented in conjunction with the current exhibition, There is a Woman in Every Color, Black Women in Art. My name is Elizabeth Humphrey. I'm the curator of There is a Woman in Every Color. Um, one of the aims of the exhibition is to provide a space to highlight the wonderful works produced by Black women artists and also give people a chance to learn about new and emerging artists that are not featured in the show. In the spirit of that goal, I've invited the founding members of the Black Lady Art Group to be in discussion with me. We'll hear about their artistic practices, the art collective, and then how they navigate the art world. At this point, I also want to mention that closed captioning is available. Um, just click the live transcript button down below in the bottom of your screen. And then feel free to ask any questions and enter them through the Q&A chat. Um, we'll have a short time at the end of the uh, lecture and discussion just to answer some of those questions from you all. Joining us today are Anisilla. Amani Height and Destiny Ariana, and they will be presenting in this order today. So a little bit about our, our artists. Amy Silla, class of 2020, is a first generation Gambian American artist who works with photography, performance art, installation art, and creative writing. Born and raised in the Bronx, Scylla was provided access to a dark room for the first time attending high school. She continued to Bowdoin College where she studied gender, sexuality, and women's studies, sociology, and visual arts, while also being a fellow of the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship. Her interests go beyond art making and extend into curating as well. Scylla's work focuses on questions and celebrations of identity, Afrofemcentrism and consumerism, particularly deriving inspiration from Black and queer people of color, Scylla describes Blackness and womanhood as, quote, inventive, counterculture, creative, and purposeful, end quote. Amani Haidt, class of 2020's culturally resonant works, embody a deep and historical effort to extend our definition of Blackness and identity. Her unconventional combinations of video, image, and music conspire to destabilize traditional videography. Born and raised in East Baltimore, Maryland, Amani generates many of her ideas, concepts, and language from her home community. Inspired by Sandra Perry's practice of computer-based media and performance to explore race and family history, Amani uses the decoding of technology itself to juxtapose the spaces where her identity lives. Amani is a Bowdoin College graduate where she studied visual arts, gender, sexuality, and women's studies, and is the former Bowdoin College Museum of Art Communications intern. Destiny Ariana, class of 2021, is a Black and Indigenous artist. She is a proud member of the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag tribe. She is also based in New York and works in the media of painting, photography, and collage. She was intrigued by art from a young age, but began her technical training at Bowdoin during her sophomore year. At Bowdoin, Ariana majored in Africana Studies, Art History and Visual Arts, while also being a member of the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program. Her senior honors thesis entitled Skin Deep, Analyzing Black Representation in the Teaching of Visual Arts, argued that the pedagogical practice in visual art courses would benefit greatly by incorporating non-Eurocentric and Western art into instruction and training. Destiny Ariana's current work addresses themes of decolonization, resilience, and beauty while exploring the history of her racial and cultural identities as a Black and Wampanoag woman. With those introductions, I just want to hand over the talk to our featured artists. Like I said earlier, Amy will go first, so take it away. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, just a moment, I will share my screen and begin my presentation. So um, like Elizabeth said, hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Amy, I'm a Bone alum from class 2016 and I'm very excited to be here today virtually with you all. 
Um, I first just want to say thank you to the Bowdoin College Museum of Art for this opportunity. It is an incredible platform for me to be able to share my art as a recent alum, especially during the celebration of the 50th year of women being integra integrated into the college and to present virtually in a space for the museum amongst artworks of artists who inspire me greatly uh, is just an incredible opportunity. So during this artist talk, I will be discussing my approach to art making, my time at Bowdoin, where my practice is now, and a little bit of stuff in between. At Bowdoin, I was a gender sexuality and women's studies major and a sociology minor, and I worked alongside my teachers and my advisors to self-direct a multidisciplinary education that incorporated my art practice alongside my non-art academic interests. I identify as a researcher, a storyteller, and an artist, and the medium I choose to narrate my stories and the stories of people around me is predominantly through photography. As a first year, I would say I wasn't yet critically thinking about my art practice in conjunction with my identities. However, I always picked up on the ways in which my interactions with other people, with spaces and with systems highlighted certain aspects of my identity. Um, like Elizabeth mentioned, I'm from the Bronx. I'm first generation. I'm Gambian American. I come from a big family and I'm very proud of the many identities also outside of what I've listed that I identify with. But I've always found myself in spaces challenging this as I was continuing to explore myself. So like I said, at a space like Bowdoin, I felt quite blindsided. It felt really, it was really white, a very wealthy, heteronormative, binary space. Um, however, while I was enrolled in photo one, I relied uh, on photography to explore my relationship with Bowdoin as a first year, where I had the resources, the support, and the physical space to further develop my emerging interest and skills. By naturally taking images of the people and things around me, almost unnaturally in a space like Bowdoin, all of my subjects were Black people, particularly Black women. And I've always been interested in themes of sexuality, commodity, power, and further analyzing my position to institutions and systems. Um, this photograph on this slide is an example of some of the works that I was dealing with and doing my first year at Bowdoin. I was interested in conceptually capturing analogies, uh, dealing with sexuality and looking at like the body form. Uh, the more I developed my art and my style, I became more comfortable asking questions I asked myself in my head out loud in my art. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, the different theories and work I was engaging with uh, within my gender, sexuality, women's studies classes and my other humanities classes, I was bringing with me to the studio. During this time, I was also exploring the differences in digital and film and the ways those two separate methods of photo making impacted the kind of work I made. Uh, now, specifically looking at this diptych here, uh, you know, to be honest, I couldn't really tell you what the assignment was for the class at this time, but I do know that I was constantly thinking about various tensions that I felt due to various identities that were being amplified while I was in college. At this time, like most times in my life, nationality was really at the forefront of my mind. Um, who represents what an American is and how does this representation morph depending on the space, depending on time, etc. Um, I still don't have that answer, but I wanted to get across this uh, like weaponized, violent, patriarchal threat that I often feel when I see the American flag due to my own experiences. However, on the flip side, this brings comfort and joy and pride to many others. Um, when I ask people their opinions on this piece, I often hear that uh, they feel this violence um, and there's a tension that people feel like the right side uh, is pretty violent with the fist and the crumpled up shorts that are made to look like the American flag. Um, but I think in making this, I felt like the left side was particularly violent in this gesture that's being made on the left. Um, and additionally, I always usually dis display these two together because I want people to ask themselves the same questions I was asking myself when making this and start that conversation while people look at the artwork. My junior year, I studied abroad at the Studio Arts College International in Florence. And while being enrolled full time in an art school, this instilled a sort of new determination within me. 
I think for me, being surrounded by other emerging artists who were just as excited about new challenges was eye-opening. Uh, I was enrolled not only in photography classes, but also performance art classes and various art history classes. And I feel like especially my time engaging in performance art um, influenced my interactions with photography, which I believe can be easily seen here. So this image is a part of a series called Potato Heads Done on Color Film. Uh, these images uh, is a collage of, well, this, this is a collage of two images. And uh, they were taken separately without the intention of collaging them. But once I printed these two images out, I noticed how the eyes lined up. And that gave me inspiration to see how much further I can, ins um, I can collage these two images together. Similarly, like the last slide, uh, these images also came out of my time in Florence. And I think that this is a beginnings of a common theme in my work of understanding the various performances we give as we shift in senses. Um, I also really enjoyed the texture of using plastic wrap and makeup together on skin. Uh, and so this was quite a fun shoot to do. Uh, and I really enjoy the ways in which the light reflects off of the plastic um, and the colors as well. So this art piece is the first piece that I made that came out of this independent study course I created my senior year at Bowdoin um, that I created and facilitated in the visual arts department. Um, and this is the class I sort of gave life to the Black Lady Art Group. I know we'll get more into the motivations uh, for the class and the collective later, but overall the main conceptual theme driving the entire class was the tensions um, and harmony between what does it mean to be in versus of. Uh, and specifically for this art piece, this came out of looking at the tensions between what does it mean to be in versus of space. So this artwork is a part of a series that so far is still untitled, but this is a finished complete art piece. Uh, this artwork hopes to challenge its viewers to consider deceptive tropes of blackface. I use variety of craft materials to reference blackface, and this work includes 3D and elements and embellishments to highlight fetishized aspects of Black women uh, that's often seen in Blackface, uh, including the nose, the lips, and the eyes. Uh, the sculptural photographic piece begins as printed photographs that I take of myself. Then I add solid forms on top of the photograph to sculpt and emphasize certain body elements. And I use a mixture of materials to create this dark and reflexive layer while also letting some of the photography peek and shine through. Post-grad, um, I've remained really interested in exploring tensions that reflect larger systemic and institutional methods of violence. I've been expanding this untitled series that was shown on the last screen, uh, and as seen here in these two pieces of artwork, and I'm looking forward to using other subjects as well besides myself and seeing how this changes my relationship to the series, as well as adopting different methods of how I make embellishments onto the body form and how I can incorporate photography more into the piece. And lastly, uh, wrapping up my presentation, I wanted to bring this back to my black and white photography roots and inspirations. Uh, and show you another example of how I'm exploring tensions uh, in black and white photography. So this is a finished piece, a part of, again, a series that I'm currently working on um, that I am expanding that's looking at different tensions as well. So this is the end of my presentation. I wanna say thank you so much to everyone for listening. Um, here on this screen is my contact information. You can see my website highlighted there as well as my email uh, for any questions or uh, concerns or commissions. Um, and thank you all for listening and for your time today. Thank you so much, Amy, for that amazing presentation. I'm going to try to get into my screen sharing. There we go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Destiny Ariana, um, and I just like to 
thank Bowdoin again for this amazing opportunity to share my work during the celebration of 50 years of women at the college. Also would love to extend my thanks to Elizabeth for curating such a powerful and monumental exhibition, highlighting black women and bringing back the black lady art group back into this space. So as Elizabeth mentioned, I majored in Africana studies, visual arts and art history while at Bowdoin. And my interdisciplinary approach to my studies has greatly influenced my artistic practice. So I was beyond thrilled to take art at Bowdoin during my sophomore year, and I never really had the opportunity to take technical courses on this level. Um, so I was really excited to see what I would learn. And these are actually two pieces that I completed during um, that experience in drawing one. So I had a great experience in the class until we came to the portraiture unit and I was the only black student in this course. So not only were we learning to draw from plaster white casts, but also everyone else in my class was white. So most of my experience in that class was drawing from white people. I struggled with capturing my darker skin and curlier hair and I really wondered why. So during that, I, so, I sought out help from professors and I was never instructed with productive means for capturing dark skin and textured hair, which, have, which eventually led for me to engage in my own artistic practice and self-taught practice. So this experience was really the catalyst for the honors project that I produced um, during my senior year at Bowdoin, which I'll get into a little later. Um, but it was also the seed that allowed me to look into portraiture as a framework and interrogation for my racial and cultural identities as a Black and Wampanoag woman. So this is actually the first um, self-portrait that I painted um, during my painting course at Bowdoin, which really made me realize that I love painting. I didn't like drawing as much as I thought, but painting was definitely something that I love to do. Um, so I made this portrait in 2019 and I was really terrified to paint myself again after the experience that I had um, in drawing one. So I was determined to learn from it. And I thought that doing a grayscale portrait because of my artistic training, teaching me how to capture lights and darks would then allow me to capture myself leading to you know, eventually moving on to capturing darker skin tones and color. So this piece titled Repression and Resistance is actually the first piece that I made out of the Black Lady Art Group. After reading Kimberly Crenshaw's piece on intersectionality, I wanted to dive into my racial and cultural identities. It represents being a Black and Indigenous woman in the context of 21st century America. The flag covering my eyes and the broken noose draping along the side of this self-portrait symbolizes what I felt knowing that I came from ancestors who were resilient and survivors. Historically, this country has tried to violently erase indigenous and enslaved Black people, but this is a, a reminder that I am here because they survived. This was also a turning point in my artistic practice because it was the first experience that I had intentionally using narrative storytelling in my work. So during my senior fall in 2020, I was remote and it forced me to think outside of the box a little bit with the material that I was using because I got so used to my space in Edwards on campus. So I had to shift gears and start to think about my process and production a little differently. I was taking narrative structures at the time and it was on my heart to create work that told the story of my indigenous heritage. I lost my Nana, who was a Wampanoag woman born and raised on Martha's Vineyard in April of 2020. And with that came the heaviness and responsibility that I can't let our stories die. They have to live on past her. So I began to think about how I could use that feeling to give it a life that lives past me. And I use art to do that. This inspired collage series, Not Your Vacation Home, takes a dive into themes of land, lineage, and legacy. Thinking of my native land, Chappaquiddick Island on Martha's Vineyard, originally named Nuepe, I wanted to address the history of erasure and bring forth some narratives that have been lost over time. I use images of ancestors and tribal members from the 1800s to the present day. I collage them with postcard images online that show Martha's Vineyard as a vacation home that many know it to be. I also use images from the Wampanoag Bible, which is a Bible translated into the Wampanoag language. And this was a representation of the barrier that I experienced not knowing my native tongue. So here are actually a few more images from the series. And 
I just wanted to highlight that I've been told that many people thought that Wampanoag people were of the past, and some were even told that they were extinct and that we were extinct. And I use this series to highlight the prevalent and rich history that exists that many have not been exposed to, to highlight the realities of colonialism and erasure. So these images are postcard size to serve as a reminder of our past, our present, and our future. It forces people to acknowledge the land that they are on and the Wampanoag people who have originally inhabited it and still inhabit it today. During my senior year at Bowdoin, I decided that creating this work and telling these stories is where I wanted to go with my practice. For senior studio at Bowdoin, we had to create a series of work that fit under a theme, idea, or concept that we created. So I entitled my senior project, What Does Native Look Like? And the piece that you're currently viewing is actually titled Blood Quantum. What Does Native Look Like? is an artistic series that explores the, complexity of, the complexities of how I've grown to and continue to grow in navigating my racial and cultural identities as a Black and Wampanoag woman. Being both Black and Indigenous, I never really understood my identities to be mutually exclusive. In some places I felt Black, and in others, I felt Wampanoag. And I struggled with this because although I grew up knowing my heritage, my physical traits labeled me into one racial category. Society often uses our physical, physical attributes as indicators of our racial and cultural identities. I knew that I was Black and other people knew that I was Black, but I knew that I was Indigenous and other people never believed me. Each piece in this series explores a deeply rooted connection between the rich culture that I was immersed in growing up and its relationship to the violent history of my ancestry to reconstruct a narrative of beauty, resilience, and survival. So this painting actually was a random idea that popped into my head and I wanted to try to figure out how to execute the image that I was seeing. So I created a digital sketch, which you can see up on the top here. Um, and a rough outline just to sort of get my vision into some sort of language for me to work with. Um, and then I actually executed a photo shoot in my dorm room just using my iPhone and my ring light. because that was my college experience. Um, and I came up with this concept. Um, so that's a little bit about my process. And then I created this image and transferred it to a sketch to canvas. And that was the birth of Blood Quantum. So here is actually a short clip of my painting process. And this painting took me about three months to complete, um, but each portrait varied in timing. So the grayscale portrait um, with the braided hair took about a month to complete. And that was the first portrait that I tackled. Um, the second grayscale portrait took about three weeks. And crazy enough, the center figure actually took me about two days. Sorry. So while creating this portrait, I had a slow start. I was unmotivated in my ideas. And halfway through, you know, about a week before it was due, um, I got the news that my, great my grandmother had passed away. So I knew that I, knew that I needed to go home um, during that time, knowing that the painting was due in a week. And I really didn't think that I would finish it. So I spent the two days before my flight home, just really in the studio working very hard to complete this portrait. And I used it as a sense of control because at that time, everything felt like it was falling apart. I mourned and processed her death while I was painting it. And I like to think that she was with me, encouraging me to finish this portrait. I say this and share this because the art process is messy. It's unpredictable and raw. And for me, that is a part of the beauty that comes along with it. The feelings that I poured onto that canvas while I was creating it gave it another layer of power that the paint couldn't give it. Blood Quantum is a three-way self-portrait that displays the internal struggle that I felt navigating these racial and cultural identities. The use of paint in a vibrant shade of red reflects the violent history of bloodshed across my identities. It addresses the hyper-visibility, visibility, and invisibility of my ident identities primarily based on physical attributes. Oftentimes our racial and cultural identities are objectified and we forget about the flesh of the person that embodies them. I painted this intentionally to illuminate my flesh and my being. It was also the last piece that I created at Bowdoin and I wanted to pay homage to my legacy at the school um, and my honors project. So the grayscale figures that you actually see in the back mimic the sculpted bust similar to the white plaster cast that I was instructed to learn from. I created these self-portraits after the bus because during my time in the visual arts department, 
I turned to my own artistic practice, my self-taught practice that with trial and error taught me how to depict black portraiture. I used myself as a reference, a starting point, and it helped me venture into the figurative representations of black and brown people. So I'm currently in an experimental phase with my practice. So I wanna to continue to try out new styles, experimenting with portraiture and collage more, but altering the media and adding more mixed media elements. I'm also diving into entrepreneurship as an artist by selling prints, eventually original pieces and going into commission work. Career-wise, I'm an artist part-time, um, but I work for a nonprofit organization that is committed to advancing on people's journey from learning to leadership through arts and media, um, providing them with transformational uh, professional development skills. So in the next year, I'm hoping to start teaching some courses in art, investing in the youth in my community, and experimenting with my practice as I continue to uh, think about what's next for me in my career. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Here also is the information that you can reach me on my website. Feel free to scan that QR code if you want to just get easy access to the website. Follow me on Instagram, you know, and thank you guys so much for being here and listening. That was awesome, Destiny and Amy. And I will begin. Let's see. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Amani Height. Um, what you just viewed is one of the videos in my ser a video series called Belonging that I created last year during the pandemic. Um, and essentially the mediums that I use, which you probably can guess, it's videography and sculpture working with found objects. Um, my inspirations that drive me uh, to my pieces and the context of my works, uh, it's Kara Walker's um, sculptures, as well as Sandra Perry's digital works, as Elizabeth Humphrey mentioned er earlier. So my idea and then just like things that I do around um, the process or my art making and who I am as a person in general, because I do believe that identity is within your art, art and who you are. Um, it's just challenging our understanding of what we, we believe is identity. Um, and what we think identity is. And I love challenging those ideas and you'll see that as I continue with my presentation. So one thing that I am very big on is the process of art making. Um, it wasn't until I actually got to Bowdoin that I even thought about the process of art making. I've always been the type of person who will go into a museum and see the finished result of a piece and say, wow, that's awesome, but never thought back to how a piece was created. And it wasn't until I started creating um, sculptures myself that I started getting into the process. I'm really big on the product um, being one thing, but the process being another piece in itself. So in these images, you'll see just one, my table to the left, uh, just really just how my brain works chaotic when it comes to making a piece, but um, beautiful chaos at that. And just the idea of piecing together my ideas on a wall, putting it together and really thinking about the process as a piece in itself before I even think about what I want to make out of it. Um, and a few of these you'll see as I move forward. Okay, 
another thing that I do when it comes to the process, if it's not me jotting down things in my um, notebook or making like a progress book itself, I'll do a video collage. So here you'll just see me just putting out all of my ideas. This is me in the green, using a green screen to like create some things. I did not know what I was creating in the beginning. I just put things on a paper and create a video. And from there, I think of it as a piece in itself. So as I mentioned earlier, I created a series called Belonging. This was a time um, when well, last year when we were asked to move off campus um, due to COVID-19. And it was also a time in my life where I truly did not know what was going on. I don't think anyone knew what was going on with COVID, but to be asked to leave campus your senior year of college um, in the middle of like you creating probably your most profound art for a capstone piece, you really, you're really all over the place. And that's what I was. I was a little all over the place, but I knew that um, I was putting myself in different spaces and I had to find a sense of belonging there. And that's where this belonging series com came from. So what you see um, to the left is my food edition of belonging. Then it's my music edition. And at the bottom, you'll see like my identity and environment um, edition of the belonging series. And in this uh, series, you'll see a mix of my life, what I feel like my life is like in Baltimore, where I'm from versus being at Bowdoin, um, another piece of my identity. Uh, I feel like I'm the same person in both spaces, but I live in different spaces. Um, and the way that I move or the way that I feel in these spaces are very different. And I decided to create this belonging series because one, I felt like I was being shifted around in different places in my life at the time. But also, I've never really created a piece about spaces where I felt were at home. Um, and never did I think I would consider Bowdoin a place where I felt like I was at home um, until COVID happened and I was asked to remove myself from it. Okay, so here's one of the videos from the Belonging series as well. You bitches better not disappoint. Crash, 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 crash. It's a dog, they crash. Let's queen both them $1,000 in the name of the legendary Sandra. I don't see no good friends lined up at the back. Jack, I got a bruise on my cheek. Both. Music. Okay, so as you can see, that was another one of my belonging videos. Um, and essentially what it did was juxtapose the type of music and environment, dance spaces that I felt like um, I grew up in versus where I was now, which was being at, in Baltimore versus at Bowdoin. Um, so here we have Negrophilia. This is a piece that I created uh, two years ago um, I was not at Bowdoin during the time. I studied abroad at Spelman or domestically at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. And then I did an abroad study at the University of Ghana in Accra, Ghana. And in, at Spelman is where I created this piece called Negrophilia. I've always been very into um, installation art and just seeing how people engage with your art when they know that the artist isn't around or they don't know who the artist is because I was always around, <laughs> but just to see how people engage with your art in that way and what they do with it um, and what they're saying about it is really important to me. So I've always been into installation art and this is probably one of my biggest installation pieces that I created. So I'll just play the shares. Um, so this is a series of five videos um, and Basically, Negrophilia is about the hypersexualization and fetishization of Black women in the porn industry. In these videos, I use Black women bodies. Um, 
as one, use black women bodies as one to sexualize them, hypersexualize them, but also to masculinize them because in a sense, these videos, they, they have a way of meshing with each other, but they also have a way to make you feel super uncomfortable. And that is exactly what I wanted. So what I did was, um, because it was an installation piece, I decided to use this modern footage um, of black women doing these sexual acts on very old box televisions. So there are about 10 box TVs, the sound of uh, TV static, and then these videos playing in silence. And, and it was also performed inside of a theater. So people were able to go into the theater whenever they please. It was open 24 seven um, and view the piece, sit down with it, get on the stage and look at them, even flip the channels. And it will always be the same video playing repeatedly. The only sound that you would hear was the sound of static. Um, and one thing that I really liked about this piece was I was able to one, see how people engaged with it, but also I was in a space where people understood um, the context behind the piece. A year later, I would have presented this same installation at Bowdoin College to see the those reactions as well and how people interacted with the piece in that way. I thought it was really, really interesting seeing how people at Bowdoin reacted to this piece versus people at Spelman College, being that I was in a black space versus a predominantly white space. Um, and it was something that I didn't really think about. I just you know, said, okay, I'll just put the piece up and install it. But just seeing how people engage with the piece in different spaces is really interesting. And it also just adds a lot more context to the piece to see how people identify with what you're saying. Um, and also going back to my idea of belonging, do you really belong in this space looking at this piece or do you not? Um, and that was something that I was really interested in. Okay, so the last thing, this is Trash Foods. This is an installation piece that I did at Bowdoin as well. Um, this piece basically highlighted black bodies um, and plastic surgery. Uh, so here you'll see some lips, some black butts, um, but also black like cultural stereotypical foods like pig's feet or chicken liver or pork liver, things like that. And it's all set up in, the, um, in a supermarket environment. So when you walk into this piece, Again, like I said, I'm really interested in seeing how people engage with my work. So when you walk into this piece, you could smell the um, scent of meat, like raw meat, um, to juxtapose the idea of raw black flesh. And lastly, this is another video that I did called Welcome to the Promised Land. Um, and I'm just gonna play it. I have no feelings against Thank you. That was welcome to the I promised land. And lastly, uh, this is just the title of an art exhibition that I curated a few years ago called And She's a Black Woman. It featured Black women artists. Um, if you look to the left, um, the pictures in the back, that is Amy's piece, actually, her photo project. Um, but essentially, it featured Black women artists in the DMV area in Maine and at Bowdoin College. And it was one of Bowdoin's first ever Black women art exhibitions that I curated. All right. And again, I want to thank Elizabeth Humphrey and the Bowdoin College Museum of Art for having myself, Amy, Destiny, Black as a collective. Um, and here's my contact information, amaniheight.com for my website. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. It is 
always a delight to see your work and to see the varied approaches that you all take to your work. Um, now that we have a little bit more of an idea about your individual approaches, I want to turn our attention to the Black Lady Art Group. Again, you all are sort of converging to create this community, taking varied approaches to your own art making practices. Um, so the first thing I want to ask is how did this artist collective come about? Were you looking for a cohort to exchange ideas or were you responding to something in your visual art studies? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so this artist collective sort of came out of an independent study course that I created as a like culmination of my um, Mellon Mays studies at Bowdoin. So I've been in Mellon Mays um, undergraduate fellowship by that time for almost two years. And I was studying a lot of different things and my research took a lot of different iterations, but um, essentially I was inspired by uh, some of the research I did on the um, Black arts movement to explore what it feels like to work in a collective and to work in community with other artists. I think for me, as well as probably Destiny and Amani can relate, um, I feel like I always approached my art practice from an individual standpoint. And I was told and taught that my art practice came from my own personal experiences and it was a very personal thing. Um, and I think that I realized that I work in community in so many other ways uh, outside of my art. So why can I not bring that into my art practice? Um, so in basically in creating this class and I worked on this class, you know, with my Melon Mays um, advisor and with uh, the visual arts department, um, and yeah, so basically with having this class, it became a natural thing for us to, um, make the class into a collective and that's how the Black Lady Art Group became an actual collective. Great. And so after you form this artist collective, tell me a little bit about the goals of the Black Lady Art Group, how, and whether you, your goals were, or objectives changed over time. Yeah, I think I can speak to this. Um, I think one of the major goals um, of the Black Lady Art Group was to create an intimate production space amongst Black women. And I was personally very excited when Amy invited us to participate um, in this collective at Bowdoin because it's something I'd never seen before. Um, I think one of the major goals at the end of the course was to produce works that throughout the semester would be displayed in highly populated areas around campus um, that would force the student bodies to engage with the themes and concepts um, that came out of the work that we were producing. Um, and then, you know, COVID happened and physically removed us from the campus space um, and altered our goals of having that strong and kind of vibrant, sudden presence of public art um, on campus. And that being said, um, I think that we work together, you know, in a crunch for time, but I think very effectively to create an online presence um, in an online space for engaging our online audience um, and friends and peers and other artists with these concepts as well. Um, and we shared an Instagram account, um, which would let others in the world see our process, our production, um, and just engage with these themes, I think, on a different level. Yeah, Destiny, you just mentioned how, you know, as we all know, COVID hit in 2020. And so it disrupted not only, you know, the world, but your, your collective and the goals of your collective as well. And I know that you all pivoted pretty successfully um, to creating a catalog and not of. And so I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about this decision, about the catalog itself and your hopes for the publication. Absolutely. So as you all know, we've all experienced COVID <laughs> at this by this point, but um, originally Amy, Destiny and I really wanted to put our work in high traffic traffic areas like Destiny mentioned earlier. We had to get very creative very fast um, and do a 360. And that is exactly what we did. So we decided to publish a book in Not Of, and I think it was probably one of the best ideas. Yes, let's go. We could have come up with, <laughs> that is our book. And essentially what we did was decide to put in everything that we learned um, in creating this class, 
our process, of course, images of our works, um, and also just like uh, some of our inspirations and artists that inspired us to, you know, create this class. Um, Amy had a really, really great amount of um, literature around just like taking up space. And of course, that's where the title and not of uh, came from. But some of that is in there too. And Amy can definitely speak to a lot of the writing that was in the book. But essentially, we didn't think that we would create a catalog. I knew we knew that we would archive our work some kind of way, but creating the catalog really opened the doors for many people um, outside of just our collective. Yeah, just jumping in on what Amani said, like we definitely knew we wanted to archive this like Amani mentioned in some way, but the catalog was really essential for us being able to in some way try and illustrate some of what we were hoping to do on campus. Um, I do also want to say like for this visual arts class, although um, this person is not part of the artist collective, we had a student curator um, who was also a class of 2020 member named Claudine Chartuni, who um, was incredibly helpful and she worked, you know, with um, campus facilities to try and get us access to spaces like the dining hall and uh, main quad. And um, she also was a pretty pivotal, she, she, she was a pretty essential part for this catalog as well, because she was able to talk to some of the, the curatorial like motivations behind the class. Um, and like Am Amani mentioned, like in the book, it talks a bit more about sort of like my motivations for creating the class, my Melon Mays research. Um, and we also have an artist interview there as well, which, you know, sort of highlights some of the um, inspirations and thoughts uh, that Amani, Desi and I have that was also uh, moderated by Claudine as well. Yeah. Um... One thing that I am thinking about right now is how, you know, you, um, Amy, you mentioned how um, you all were working individually and then coming together as a collective to sort of build that, that network. And so since, you know, the Black Lady Art Group is fostering community with artists on campus, I'm curious as to how you've expanded your artist network, either as a unit through Black or, or individually. Yes, so of course the objective of the class was to take up space and uh, of course we did just that, but not only did we take up space within the class, we just took up space within the actual building that we worked in, which was Edwards Art Museum. Um, we had two space, well we had one space to ourselves, and um, Amy and Destiny worked in that space and then uh, lucky, luckily enough I had um, my own uh, studio space myself that I was working in for another class. Um, so in that sense, we took up space within like physical space within the building. Um, and then, of course, Black was a new class. This was something that Bowdoin has never seen before, um, a all Black women art class. That was unheard of before we started this collective. Um, but outside of that, ways that we decided to foster community, um, especially being an independent study, we didn't have all of the I guess like accessibility to every the spaces that other classes had larger classes we decided to ask outside um, guests to come in and do critiques with us and it was really 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 insightful for us because we got to get different perspectives us being black women um, and it being a black woman course we knew that and we and we're very close with each other we're very open and honest but it was really good just to get eyes from the outside to let us know like hey you know, maybe you could try this out, maybe you could do this, add this, maybe try it in this space. Um, and then as Amy mentioned earlier, working with Claude Dean, our student curator, we also had um, Bowdoin staff and faculty come in and give us their input. Um, even if they didn't come into our actual space or come to our critiques, they were there. Um, Carrie Skanga as well as um, a support system for us as a way to like basically create some sense of community in such a short period of time as well, a short period of time that we did not anticipate. Um, and we were able to do that. Outside of that, we created an Instagram page um, where we were able to post a lot or stay engaged with our viewers, of course, and our followers. But we were able to post a lot of our works there, continue to talk about the process. We were gearing towards a virtual setting at this point. So we had to figure out something fast. And that was the best thing we could have done. It's still up if you would like to view it as well. 
Um, but that was another way that we decided to foster community outside of the actual space that we worked in and outside of Bowdoin in general. Great. I'm just checking the time here and I, I actually want to pivot to some of the questions that are um, coming in. But before I do that, I just want to jump down um, to our, our question just about how some thinking about parallels between your work and the exhibition itself. And so as you all know, the exhibition explores Black women artists and their artistic approaches, um, revealing primarily how artists are responding to expectations placed on quote unquote Black art um, and the burden of representation that they face as well. And so I just wanna know, have these expectations or burdens sort of been placed on you as, as artists and how are you responding to those challenges? Um, yeah, I definitely felt that in a number of ways. Um, I think one burden that I felt with having a practice that's primarily based on, you know, portraiture and Black and Indigenous history, I struggle a lot with the concept of pain and trauma along with beauty and how those two can kind of coexist. Um, and it's something I'm definitely still conceptualizing. But I feel like um, a lot of times I get asked, like, why do I include so many like tra traumatic experiences in my work? And like, why am I choosing to highlight those violent experiences? Um, and a lot of people say, you know, like you should just keep painting those beautiful portraits and focusing on, you know, the beauty without, you know, the pain. Um, and it's like, yeah, like my portraits still depict something that's beautiful, but I grew tired of the narrative that that violent history is continuously swept, swept under the rug and not addressed. Um, and I think that to answer your question, agency has grown to be something that's very important for me as an artist um, and understanding that I have a choice and a voice to express through my, my art I and mean, my practice, these stories that I believe you know, need to be told um, and valuing that importance. So my thing is just realizing, and I think over time growing to understand that agency comes from me and not from anyone else. Mm, that's good. Yeah. I'll just add something. So let's oh, go for it. I'll just add something very brief, <laughs> very brief. I was the only black woman, I was the only black visual arts major um, for my four years at Bowdoin. So I've always found myself in spaces with people who just did not look like me. They were white, like to be, to be transparent. Um, so sometimes my art was perceived as black art um, and not just art and me being a black artist. And sometimes people did not know how to respond to that work, my works, because they thought it was an identity thing. And because they're not black, they can't respond. Um, and it wasn't until my junior, no, senior year at Bowdoin, when I actually left Bowdoin and came back and, and showed my work in other spaces and then came back and figured out a way to engage with my audience to make them feel a little bit more comfortable, which is not something, not a word that I like to say, but make people feel a little bit more comfortable and open with, you know, responding to my work. And sometimes it took a nudge, like, hey, calling out someone, hey, can you tell me what you think about this piece or what do you think about this section of the work? But sometimes you have to put yourself out there just a little bit because people don't know how to engage with art that they are perceiving as Black art and not just art. Yeah. Astute comments, you guys, astute. Um, we're having a lot of questions in the Q&A just about um, audience perception. Um, some people are asking, you know, how were art pieces received by a majority white student population at Bowdoin, but also um, how the art is being perceived differently at Spelman, which is an HBCU and comparing that to Bowdoin, which is a predominantly white institution. So. Um, Amani, I think you can sort of speak to the, the Spellman Bowdoin comparison, but just for all of you, are there differences in, in audience that you're taking into account? Um, again, like I said before, my presenting my work at Spellman um, was a different, it was a different space. Like we know that it's a, a, a historically black um, college versus a predominantly white college being at Bowdoin. And the funny thing is my professor, my like art professor at Spelman was a white man, um, but my classes were black. Like my, the students in my classes were black. There was one white student in my class. Um, but basically presenting my work at Spelman, for me, I just felt more comfortable. 
So which gave me like free range to be more experimental because I was comfortable in that space versus being at Bowdoin. Sometimes I would take into perspective my audience and how they would feel about things. It wasn't until I actually came back to Bowdoin my senior year that I literally had no regrets about anything that I was doing. I was just like, OK, I'm going to do what I want to do because this is my art. Um, but presenting my art in those two spaces, I got more feedback, more like uh, useful feedback at Spelman than I've ever gotten at Bowdoin. Um, and it really, really helped me and encouraged me to push myself more when I came back to Bowdoin to like go against everything that I thought people thought of me or thought of me as an artist and who I even thought of myself as an artist. Um, I was more open and and truly like, I just didn't care. I just did what I, what I wanted to do at that point. But it took me going to Spelman to get that encouragement um, to actually become this way. Yeah, I agree with Amani. I feel like I thinking back to the kind of artist I was freshman and sophomore year, I remember being like terrified of critiques uh, in my art classes. And not because I doubted my technique, um, but really because I was nervous about how my like peers would really um, interact with my artwork. I know this is something that a lot of other students predominantly students of color or students of other marginalized identities feel that um, sometimes you feel like people don't really engage with your artwork when it feels really political or it feels really like it goes against the grain or the norm. Um, something I'm really grateful for though is that my you know professors at Bowdoin have always been very supportive of me you know being out there being explicit so on and so forth but sometimes it's really difficult to feel like you really get honest critique that you need like critique the critique the technique critique the artwork what you see and that was another reason why this arts collective was so useful because I think it was one of the first times in a class setting that artists who looked like me and understood where I was coming from was truly engaging with my artwork in ways that I wanted, you know, I felt a difference sometimes in the ways in which my artwork was received in class critiques than my other white peer, um, students uh, and how their artwork was perceived. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to sort of add that, that I definitely feel like once I sort of left Bowdoin and came back, I felt a lot more confident in presenting my artwork, uh, regardless of how people were taking it. Um, and I think in particular, the reason why I really love seeing how, seeing how people engage with my artwork is because oftentimes, especially with the piece that I mentioned, that was one of the first pieces that came out of Black Lady Art Group, um, People look at it and it looks very visually appealing. It looks pretty, it's it's sparkly, it's glittery. And then once people look more into it, they realize this really like violent, traumatic stuff that's behind it. Um, and I found that I really enjoy the way in which people engage with the work in that way. That's sort of, sort of traps them in to really look at the work and understand it a bit more uh, than I was experiencing before um, and how students were engaging with my work in critiques when I was, you know, like a first year or sophomore. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this is just to all of you as, you know, emerging artists and recent alumna. Um, do you have any advice for art majors trying to find ways to keep making work after graduation? How do you carve out that time? Um, I would say sometimes you just have to do it. Like you have to prioritize that if that's something that you really um, want to. I think that with me, it was like giving myself time to Car like carving out that time intentionally and being very intentional about it I also think I kind of had to like I went through a transition period where it was like I was so used to creating work for classes and having prompts and themes but then it's like oh like I'm I'm out here in like the real world and now I have to make stuff for me like what does that mean and I'm definitely still like I've only graduated like what five six months ago so for me that's a little different still trying to do that but I think there's a few a freedom and a beauty in having that um you know um agency to really create stuff that's coming from you and it's like what you really want to so I think with me it was also like the freedom of the pressure that I'm not making this to completely like be taken in by a class and like have that critique um but I would just say giving yourself that time to create um and kind of scheduling it out and illuminate I mean eliminating all of the pressures that come along with I think creating work under a department um that's so strict in producing for uh you know critiques and things like that and really focus on the technical and just focus on what you want to do to create and express yourself through your practice 
Well, with that, I want to just thank our wonderful artists that are here and joined me in conversation. I want to thank our audience for for listening and engaging in a nice um, Q&A discussion as well. I just want to remind you all that the exhibition There is a Woman in Every Color is up at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art and it will close on January 30th, 2022. So if you have not seen it, please, please check it out. Um, of course, visit Amy, Destiny, and Amani's websites to see more of their work um, and engage with them and, you know, do nice things for, for their, their professional endeavors. Um, and I just want to thank you all again, and we'll see you all soon.